Almighty and Heavenly Father, we give to you all the praise, glory and honour. Indeed, Almighty God, it is a wonderful privilege this morning to be gathered together in the name of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Indeed, Almighty God, we praise you for you are sovereign. And in these times, Lord, as we worship and adore you, we come to understand how powerful you are. Indeed, Lord, not only are you powerful, but Lord, in your sovereignty, you are in complete and utter control. And so, Lord, this morning we come to worship and adore you. Indeed, Lord, may we in the stillness of this new day come to understand what it means to be still and know that you are God. For Father, we live in a world where there is so much noise, where there is so much busyness, that Lord, that we are not able truly to be still and know that you are God. And indeed, Lord, as we glorify and honor your name, Lord, we know that we have sinned against you in word, deed, and thought. And so, Father, this morning, as we come into your presence, Lord, may you guide us as we confess our sin. Lord, may you show to us where we have failed you and where we have disappointed you. But Lord, as we come, may we confess our sin and know that through the precious blood of Christ that we are cleansed and renewed. And say, Holy Father, forgive us in Jesus' name. And indeed, Lord, as we continue to worship you, May we know that you have forgiven us, that we have been cleansed from all sin, and that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Holy Spirit, may you come upon us, may you fill us, may you overwhelm us with your presence, so that as we worship God, that we may not worship in our own strength or our own ability, but Lord, may we worship you through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship God with our hymns and songs of praise and worship. <clears throat> Let us begin with, He is exalted, the King is exalted on high.
Please be seated. It is always wonderful to gather in the house of the Lord. It's always wonderful that after or before a very busy week, that we can just come and be still and know that God is still in control. And this morning, <clears throat> as we come before God, we come before Him with grateful hearts. And so this morning we come to that point in the service where we come to God with our prayers of intercession or possibly even prayers of praise and thanksgiving. And so just to give you an opportunity, we are going to, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand uh, and then you can just stand and just shout out the prayer need and this morning we would like to share with you as we seek God and Him alone. And so who would like to start? No one. For the this morning, prayer of Thanksgiving on the request, but I want to cancel. And please pray happy birthday for you as your well. birthday was earlier this week. Congratulations, Wayne. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. that has rotted away government. We pray, Lord, that you will also enable us as a nation to find a solution to the energy crisis that we are experiencing. And Lord, somehow in South Africa we have times when we have what I call a strike season and we seem to be going through one at this time. Lord, we pray that employees and employers may be reasonable and that each one will find a solution to the labour issues. But Lord, indeed, we pray for those who do not have work today too. We pray, Lord, that in your grace that you will be Jehovah Jireh, their provider. But Lord, indeed, we pray that you will provide them with the job. For we know that when a family member has a job, that there is stability in the family. And so Lord, we just pray, look upon us with grace. Lord, too, we come before you this morning and just pray for those who have been able to go away for these school holidays. Lord, we just pray, grant them traveling mercies there and back. And indeed, Lord, we just pray, be with each one of us as we continue to trust in you. Lord, we pray that you will be with those who are ill and those who are sick. 
Father, you know what they are going through. We pray, Lord, that you will be with those who are depressed and lonely today. We pray, Lord, that by the grace and comfort of your Spirit, that they will know that you are with them. And Lord, this morning, we just pray for your church. We pray, Lord, that in these times where things seem so dark, foreboding, and evil, we pray, Lord, that as your church, that we may stand up and be counted. We pray, Lord, that we truly will be the salt and the light. And we pray, Lord, that in these times, that your church may bring hope and that Jesus may bring salvation. And Lord, may your spirit descend upon us now as each one of us quietly pray. Hear our prayers, dear Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have heard our prayers. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to go before us. And we pray, Lord, that we may be astounded by our miracle working God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to come to God's Word and hear God's Word, let us sing together our, our um, hymn of invocation of the Spirit. Our in fellowship suite, we will sit at Christ.
on your word. And indeed, Holy Spirit, as you have inspired the word, so we pray that you will inspire us this morning as we listen. As we listen to God's word. Amen. Boy, I must say they're on time today. <laughs> This morning, we begin a new section within the Sermon on the Mount. But its theme is the same as we have been studying since we entered the section of Scripture. What is the true nature of righteousness? Is it the righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees. In the Beatitudes, we saw the characteristics that will make that will mark the person who is righteous in heart, poor in spirit, mournful over sin, weak, meek, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, merciful. Pure in heart and a peacemaker, with the result that the unrighteous will persecute them. None of these characteristics can be produced by our own efforts. They are the product of a human who is regenerated by God's Holy Spirit. We saw in the next section of the sermon that Jesus did not come to annul the law, but instead he taught that even the smallest part of it would not pass away until all was accomplished. Jesus restored the meaning and spirit of the law which the scribes and Pharisees had distorted. He gave six specific illustrations of this contrasting the spirit of the law with the teaching of the self-righteous religious leaders. True righteousness keeps the spirit of the law which is from the heart. When God looks down upon us God does not look at what we do. God looks at what is in the heart. Do you remember when God told Samuel to find a new king for Israel? God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse. And Jesse had a number of sons and um, the first few sons looked like the front uh, row team of the South African Springboks. And um, Samuel would say, Lord, is this the one? Is this the one? And God said to him, God said to him, I do not look at the outward as man looks. I look at the heart. I look at the heart. And so in Matthew chapter 6, again, Jesus teaches us that true righteousness is not about keeping the letter of the law, but it is about keeping the spirit of the law, which comes from the heart. Not just the letter of the law, but outward actions. Murder is sinful, but so is unrighteous anger. Adultery is sinful. But so is lustfully looking on someone other than your spouse. The voice is not commanded and results in increased adultery except for one specific cause. The righteous do not lie and keep their promises. In addition, when the righteous are unfairly treated, they rely upon God and do not seek revenge. In fact, they go on even to love 
their enemies. Now we enter a new section. Jesus' theme is still the same, but instead of contrasting the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees, he will now contrast their religious practices in three specific areas. Giving alms, not alms, but A-L-M-E-S. Giving alms, fasting, and prayer. In each of these areas, they had turned what was supposed to be an act of worship to God into a display of self-righteousness. After Jesus deals with these three areas, he gives three prohibitions. He commands to not do certain general things found in the lives of these self-righteous religious leaders. The person who is truly righteous will desire to do all for the glory of God instead of the glory for themselves. Matthew 6 verse 1. This verse continues the theme of the sermon and marks off the main thought that runs through each of the illustrations and prohibitions that follow later. It reads in Matthew 6 verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Before we go further, let me correct something that sometimes causes confusion in the scripture. Some translations probably use the word righteousness in verse 1. And another term in verse 2, while others use the same word. The King James Version uses arms. And the New King James Version uses charitable deeds. In both verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 is the general case. And verse 2 begins a specific illustration on it. In this passage, Jesus is dealing with the motives that are in the heart of the human. Once again, we see that true righteousness is a matter of the heart and not just outward behavior. There are some that have used this verse and the following passages that illustrate its principle to teach that we are to do everything in secret and that if someone sees you, then you have lost your heavenly reward. Again, we find that this is an error in interpretation. Again, this is an error in interpretation. It is like all the others we have noted while going through the text. Humans are very quick to look for verses to back up what they already think. This is called proof texting. If you use verses and phrases without, carefully con without careful consideration of their context, you can pretty much make the Bible to say anything you want it to say. Just be very careful. Don't be like the fellow who decided he was going to look up verses gunshot. So he's going to open his Bible up and it said, And Judas went and hung himself. He thought, no, God can't be giving me that message. So he quickly opened up his Bible again and it said, And thou shalt go and do likewise. And he thought, oh my goodness, what's going on here? Let me try again. And actually opened it. And the Bible said, and thou shalt do it quickly. <laughs> so be very careful how you read the Bible. The, Bi the passage may not really teach what they say it does. Whenever biblical interpretation is done without careful consideration of the context, then error can easily jump into that interpretation. Jesus says in verses 3 and 4 that your right hand should not know what the left hand is doing so that your charity may be in secret. In verse 6, Jesus says to Pray to your father in secret. 
In verses 17 and 18, he says, Do not let people see that you are fasting. Is Jesus teaching that we should be careful that no one ever sees us giving money to someone else or putting it in the tithe bag at the back of the church? Is Jesus really saying that all prayer should be in private and that public prayer is without reward? <coughs> is Jesus saying that if someone finds out you're fasting, then your reward for skipping all those meals is gone? No. If he did, then we had better set up a system by which you can give to the church by depositing cash and not checks as they are traceable into a night security box here at the church so that no one will see you do it. But let, let us look back at Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Jesus says there too, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Is Jesus now contradicting this in chapter 6? Of course not. Remember, the context is the nature of true righteousness versus self-righteousness. Jesus is contrasting the practice of the scribes and the Pharisees with true righteousness. The issue through this whole section is your motivation. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Is it to bring glory to God as stated in Matthew 5 verse 16? Or is it to gain glory from fellow humans as described here in Matthew chapter 6 verse 1? Scripture records over and over that the motivation of the scribes and Pharisees was to gain, to gain glory from fellow humans. Luke 16 verses 13 to 15 says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and they were scoffing at him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For the highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. You may be able to fool people about the nature of your heart, but you cannot fool God. He knows your heart, what you esteem and what you do not. He knows whether you love Him or just yourself. This is a very difficult thing to deal with. What is my motive for so many things I do or do not do? Are they really done for God's glory or for my own? Is it God's approval I want or the approval of fellow humans? Even things we would like, even things we would think would certainly be for God's glory can be done with the wrong motivation and there will be no reward. What about you? Why are you here today? Is it because you genuinely want to come and gather with other believers and praise God corporately? Do you listen to the sermon because you want to understand, understand God and His Word better and live according to it? Or do you come for some other reason? Does someone make you come against your will? Do you come because it keeps you out of trouble with your wife or husband? Now that was me, I'm just joking. Never. <laughs> Do you come because it keeps you out of trouble? Are you trying to impress someone else? Or perhaps even yourself? 
with how spiritual you are. Do you see how subtle this can be? It's a very, very, very thin line. The scribes and Pharisees were really no different than we are even as fundamental Christians are today. They thought what they were doing was pleasing to God. They thought they were doing all that God <laughs> asked them to do. It was not until Jesus exposed their hearts that their true motivation for what they did came out for all to see. Now, I'm not trying to get us to the point where we are second-guessing everything we do and driving ourselves crazy with this extreme introspection. But we do need to examine ourselves and see why we do what we do. If Paul would issue a warning to the Corinthians to test yourselves to see if you are in the faith, examine yourselves, or you do not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 If we should test ourselves concerning our very salvation, then certainly we should examine the motivations of our hearts and correct them. In fact, in very practical terms, you cannot truly live the Christian life. Jesus has called you. Let me start again. You cannot truly live the Christian life. Jesus has called us to. If your motivation is anything other than wanting to please God and bring Him glory. You may be able to fake things for a while just because you want other Christians to approve of you. But eventually your heart will come out. We are to be poor in spirit. We are to come to God as beggars who have and can offer nothing but only to plead for God's grace and mercy. A person cannot take the self-despising attitude for a, while, for a while. But eventually pride will arise even over the ability to be so self-abasing. True humility of heart only comes when a person sees and believes him or herself to be unworthy of God. For only then will there be true gratitude toward God and a desire to please Him. Only people consumed with their relationship with God will be concerned about attitudes as well as actions. They will be just as concerned with unrighteous anger that occurs in their heart as they would be if they murdered someone. They seek to put to death the desires of the flesh and not just avoid carrying them out. In a bad marriage, they do not seek an easy way out but strive to be as Hosea that continually demonstrates the love of God to a wayward spouse. They keep their promises. Their word can be trusted because they know that God holds them accountable for every word they speak. Finally, true righteousness is of the heart. And it comes out in the motivation behind what we do, say, and think. That is important because it is not enough for us to do good and nice things. Even those with no claim to know Jesus can be good and nice. Therefore, in conclusion, if we are to live the way that Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount, then we must die to self and live for Him alone. Paul said it so well in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If I am crucified with Christ and He lives in me, then my greatest concern in all that I do are 
What does Jesus think about this? What does Jesus think about this? Or if you've seen people, they have a, um, a band around their arm that says WWJD. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What does he want me to do? And not what do I think? Or what do other people think? Have you been crucified with Christ? Are you putting to death the deeds of the flesh? And laying aside your sin? Does your reward come from your heavenly father? Or from fellow human beings? Who motivates you? What motivates you? It is my prayer that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, will motivate you. And that you will give anything to be in a relationship with Him. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise and thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us this morning that our motivation should be you and you alone. O oh, Father, this morning challenge us about our motivation. Lord, teach us that it is not about feeling, but Lord, that it is about loving you. O oh, Father, if our love was based on feeling, we would probably never love. But love, your love, Lord, is demonstrated on the cross. You died on the cross of Calvary for us, not because you felt it was a good thing to do, but you did it because you loved us unconditionally and you want each and every one of us to be in a relationship with you. And so, Father, teach us this morning to be aware of our motivation. And may our motivation always be Christ crucified. May our motivation always be Jesus Christ and Him alone. And Father, this morning we thank you for your generosity and grace to us. Thank you, Lord, for all those things for which we take life for granted. Thank you for our warm beds, our families, for the food we eat each day, for the luxuries we enjoy. And now, Lord, we pray that as we give to you our tithes, gifts and offerings through the bags as we walk out, or, Lord, as we EFT money into the church account, we pray, Lord, that your blessing will be upon that which we seek to do. And, Lord, indeed, in all that we do, may we give glory, honour and praise to God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's stand. It's number five on the back of the sheet. It is immortal, invisible, God, only one. Let's stand.
for this time shared in your presence. Oh, Father, as we go out into this new week, may we go with you as our motivation. And indeed, Lord, we pray in all that we say and do, that we will glorify and honour your name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>